Uh, go ahead. Hi, welcome to the one day building a union three day challenge. Um, first, this is a pro union challenge and we're going to take a few precious hours to see exactly how we can make the union movement the kind of organization we want to join. Um, we want to make it invigorating and it actually comes from the bottom up as a vehicle uh, working dignity, justice, and a force for change. You ask who I am? My name's Terry Haley, and I am the former vice president of the CWA 9503, actually the executive vice president. And I worked my way up in the ranks in the union, uh, starting off as an area steward, then made it to district steward, and worked at the local, and then uh, ran for executive vice president. For those of you who don't know, uh, Terry is my co-host. I'm Dan McCrory. I've got 40 years in the labor movement myself, 37 with the Communication Workers of America, uh, nine years on the executive board, three as local president. And I coordinated our PR during the first nationwide strike ever in 1989. I also taught some classes. And I've lobbied in California State Capitol and also in Washington, D.C. And we're here for the next three days uh, to actually answer some questions. First, what do unions do wrong? And what do unions do right? And also, how do we change to meet the challenges of our future? Um, some really big questions. Now, just to let you know that we have muted everybody's mic to cut down on noise, and, but we're keeping a close, white, close watch on Facebook to see any questions uh, that do pop up. Uh, one of the issues a lot of us seem concerned about these days are police unions. That was a big issue when I was first planning this uh, seminar. Where are you, Terry?
Where are you, Terry? Hey Siri, text my wife. Three minutes. Your message to Terry Haley says three minutes. Ready to send it? Okay, it's sent. Hi. Hi. Alexis is inside hanging with the dogs. Sorry, I'm having trouble understanding right now. Please try a little later. We need to um, close the door. It's not really cold in here. Want to turn down? The dogs. Turn down. There was a um, coyote in the yard, so we can't let the dogs out. Okay. Okay, we lost it. <coughs> it's just turning. Fuck. God damn it. Probably the link time time out. I feel really short. Want to switch chairs? Oh. Or should I lower myself? Well, you need to point the screen down, otherwise you're not going to be able to see me. Far down as it goes, and you'll be able to see you. Come on.
See, it's dark. I can't get up right now. There we go. First, I give you a preview and then you go live. Okay, so you're done here. Ready? Mm -hmm. Let's start right away. Don't start right away. Do I? Yes. It says I. You know, say. Do you um, want to click on go live anyways, or? Uh, I guess I'll put. Oh, for you. See ya. <laughs> Bring the window up for live. I don't want that one.
Oh, no. And uh, it said live, all you had to do was scroll in. But it was live on the wrong page. I don't want it on my personal page, I want it on this page. Okay, let's go ahead and start with this and hopefully we'll get somewhere with it. I'm gonna go ahead. Hi, welcome to the One Day Building a Union three day challenge. Um, first, this is a pro union challenge and we're gonna take a few precious hours to see exactly how we can make the union movement the kind of organization we want to join. Um, we wanna make it invigorating, and it actually comes from the bottom up as a vehicle uh, working dignity, justice, and a force for change. You ask who I am, my name's Terry Haley, and I am the former vice president of the CWA 9503, actually the executive vice president. And I worked my way up in the ranks in the union, uh, starting off as an area steward, then made it to district steward, and worked at the local, and then uh, ran for executive vice president. For those of you who don't know, uh, Terry is my co-host. I'm Dan McCrory. I've got 40 years in the labor movement myself, 37 with the Communication Workers of America, uh, nine years on the executive board, three as local president, and I coordinated our PR during the first nationwide strike ever in 1989. I also taught some classes and I've lobbied in California State Capitol and also in Washington, D.C. And we're here for the next three days uh, to actually answer some questions. First, what do unions do wrong? And what do unions do right? And also, how do we change to meet the challenges of our future? Um, some really big questions. Now, just to let you know that we have muted everybody's mic to cut down on noise. And, but we're keeping a close, white, close watch on Facebook to see any questions uh, that do pop up. Uh, one of the issues a lot of us seem concerned about these days are police unions. That was a big issue when I was first planning this uh, seminar. I've asked uh, Jerry Fletcher about it, and here's that interview. Hopefully it should be playing now.
Hi, everybody. This should be second now. I should be getting a request from my first speaker to join us. And as soon as I add her on here, it's unstable. So I think it's always a good thing to see when you're trying to transmit out to the world. But uh, that's the way it goes here sometimes. My office is uh, really far from the server, so uh, that uh, happens on occasion. Natalie, if you can hear me, um, I sent you the most recent link, and you should be able to get in now. Let me know if it is giving you the wrong information, such as the wrong I copied it and sent it a response from you, and we'll know in a minute if this is going to pan out. I'm calling you. Oh, I can't make the call. Um, why isn't this working? I sent you the link and didn't go through, I guess, because of my unstable connection. Uh, let's see what I can do again. D number, I'm not sure what the ID number would be. I think, ah, uh, meeting ID right there. 842-3033-3070. That's the meeting ID. Uh, I'm talking about something else, don't worry. And they were still standing by here to have you join us. I'm going to go and meet the office.
Okay, I'm a fish. technically challenged person in a technical oh, okay I think we're ready to rock and roll. Hello. Hi, Ed. Hi Natalie, finally. <laughs> we're here, yay. Yeah. And we can go ahead and do our preliminary stuff and then we'll uh, introduce you guys. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the three-day building union challenge. Um, yesterday, we learned that there may not be a place for police unions in the House of Labor. And we heard there is hope with the new generation of activists. Um, we discussed the new world that is following me and an illegal to president and i want to thank um we will get to as many as we can you're probably getting feedback so you probably want to mute the facebook live yeah then it should work just fine all right yeah, that's old stuff you're listening to there's a 20 second lag <laughs> Hello. So if you mute that, I won't be talking over myself. We're here, hey. Yeah. Mute that, please. We can go ahead and do our preliminary. Uh, who, who are you talking to? Natalie, you. Uh, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, or, okay, it must be Ed. Then. Day two of the three-day building union challenge. Ed, um, can you uh, mute can Facebook? May not police unions in that labor. Hey, did you get that? Add mute Facebook. We discussed the new world that is following me. There you go. Now we can hear one conversation at a time. Right now, we'd like to introduce a candidate for the State House of Maine, Natalie DiPatino, and campaign staff and right hand man, Ed Hunt. Welcome to you both. Not to put you on the spot, but I've been on both sides of this and mm -hmm. have a few questions every candidate according to Labor's endorsement should ex expect. Ed, this is a friendly crowd. Feel free to add your comments. We will get to as many as we can. You're getting feedback, so you probably want to mute the Facebook Live. Here we go again. Finish just fine. And yeah, we were getting double conversations again. I don't have anything else on. Okay. Okay. We'll start with the first question if you're ready. Isn't technology wonderful? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, somebody said you use Facebook. There you go. Yeah, are you on Facebook so, Live, Ed? No, well, I, 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 I'm in Zoom. I couldn't connect you on Facebook. There's a. Um, Did somebody else in the house have their phone on it? Not to put you on the spot, but I've been on both sides of this and mm -hmm. have a few questions every candidate. Did that work? Apparently so. Yay. Okay. Natalie, your first question comes from Terry. 
Okay, okay. Natalie, I want to know why is it that you're running? Well, um, I went to the caucus because I wanted to be a Bernie Sanders delegate again. I was in 2016 and hardly anyone showed up. There was no one else from my town even there. And two officials from the main Democratic Party asked if I would be interested in running for office. They said we really needed someone as a Democrat. Okay, so you were saying that you went to the caucus and there was no one else there from your town. Your town. That's right. And all of the other towns were there. Uh, two officials from the main Democratic Party asked if I would be interested in running for state representative. Uh, they said they really needed a Democrat to run against the Republican running in my district. I said, what does the job entail? And um, they said it was three days a week, six months a year. And I said, oh, I can do that. What they failed to tell me was that you had to become a politician, which I really had no clue what that was about. Uh, so before I could even really think it over, I felt myself just saying yes. And this was before Bernie had suspended his campaign. Mm -hmm. And then when I found out that he did, uh, what reverberated in my head after I received the letter as the rest of the delegates did was that it's not just him, it's us. And I felt like I was challenged to be the us and to take it forward and represent the values that a lot of us progressives have and bring them to the table and put our money where our mouth is. You know, it doesn't do a lot to just um, complain on Facebook uh, <laughs> or complain about who we have as a candidate. I guess I'm going to be the change I wish to see. So that is why I uh, fell into this. I It wasn't something I had dreamed of. Very good. So what are your key issues? Um, you know, one of my key issues is health care, obviously. Um, we don't have enough, and it isn't available to everyone. Also, getting health care out here. I live in a very rural community that's filled with elderly people, and they don't have the services that they need. And I know that that's not a union issue necessarily, but these people work their whole lives, and now here they are wanting to stay in their homes and mostly able to stay in their homes but without the ability to get some of the services they need because they're too far away or because they don't have enough coverage. And um, we also have young people who are addicted to drugs and um, that's an epidemic in my area. And I wanna ask my community to help me find solutions to those problems. Um, we also need jobs in our area, good paying jobs that have benefits and that would be where the union piece would come in. If we can find some jobs and organize, these people can retain their jobs and have a better life. Um, and education is another key piece for me, but did you have any questions on that? It sounds like you're gonna be really busy because there's I am, a, I am. a lot of issues to tackle. Um, yes. But uh, looking out for seniors, looking out for other folks is very much a union tradition. Um, and let me ask you, Natalie, are you yourself a union member? I am not a union member, and I have never been a union member, um, but I do come from a family where I have a lot of union members in my family. Um, the closest one to me was my ex-husband. Uh, we were married for 10 years. He worked at Union Pacific Railroad, where he still works as a fireman oiler. And the union saved his job. He had a train accident, uh, millions of dollars in damage, and his union griever saved us. You know, they came out there and they took care of us, um, as well as having some of the best insurance money can buy for my children and excellent benefits. And the last time I spoke to him, we're not close, obviously we're divorced, but he said the unions were in trouble and they needed help. And uh, if there's something that I can do to help, I definitely would, as well as my stepfather uh, is a teacher and was, was a member of a union. My father, as a construction worker, was in several unions, both in Colorado and in Chicago. 
And my stepfather, who worked for the airlines, was my first stepfather, uh, also in a union back a long time ago. How much of a presence does the union have in? Did you catch? Oh, there we go. That one. Does the union have in your community? In my actual community, it doesn't have a large presence. And my whole district, um, you know, other than teachers and healthcare workers, there isn't a huge union presence. Um, really, the larger union presence would be in Bangor. However, there is opportunity. And since this is about union building um, in the logging industry, I think there are opportunities for more union members in my area. Um, if that was something that we could build. Yeah, have you ever crossed a picket line or had a need to cross? No, when, when I was a kid, um, my mother referred to people who crossed picket lines as scabs. And uh, in Chicago, um, where my father was a, a construction worker and a contractor, um, if if there was a picket line and people were crossing it, they would blow up. I was telling Ed, this giant rat. I don't know if you've ever seen them, uh, yeah. but crossing a picket line was a sort of taboo uh, for me growing up. And, and I would not do that. That would undermine the efforts of the workers and what they're trying to do uh, with their um, protest. Gotcha. Um I know in California, when you run for office, it costs a lot of money. Uh, what kind of resources do you have at your disposal? Well, um, when the Democratic Party told me how much money I was expected to raise for my campaign, I felt that it was obscene. Um, <laughs> so apparently it costs a lot of money to run anywhere. Uh, we're very bare bones and grassroots, as Ed can tell you. Um, I had rate, I had tried to be a clean candidate and I failed, uh, it was coronavirus. And even though we made our best effort to call people so I could qualify, I did not qualify. So right now we have about $45 in our account. Um, <laughs> and I do need to make an effort to try and raise more money, uh, for the campaign, but I haven't even officially launched yet. Uh, we're still strategizing how we're going to do that. Okay. Um, Can you tell oh, me how, how crucial is labor to your campaign? Well, Ed tells me that it's very crucial. Ed, do you want to take this? Sure. Uh, well, I think the, the, the well, to, to also, to, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, well, just first, to, if I can preface by following up on some of uh, Natalie's earlier comments. Uh, in relation to the question of like union membership in our area. Uh, well, I, I saw a recent statistic. Uh, there's 11.8% of uh, main workers are unionized. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, across the state, uh, and I think uh, as uh, Natalie mentioned, uh, membership is not evenly distributed. Uh, there's a lot of rural areas. Uh, traditionally, uh, Timber and paper mills was the main source of uh, employment. A lot of the paper mills have shut down. Uh, mm. You know, we, I, you know, I know that Natalie is absolutely, you know, uh, I mean, part of her values is to support workers' organization. That's the labor movement. Uh, I think in order to expand uh, in, in a lot of these rural areas, we, have, we, uh, we need jobs in order to have uh, unions. That's <laughs> and, true. Uh, so I, we need to figure out, you know, ways to have a collaborative effort uh, to, you know, advance the union cause and, and to bring jobs to a lot of these depressed areas. Uh, I know this, our particular neck of the woods in uh, Penobscot County, uh, or at least in the northern part of the county, that, you know, there's just small towns, uh, a lot of people living in, you know, in, in, in rural areas, and uh, I'm struck. I'm a recent arrival to Maine, so I'm struck by the the poverty that I see uh, in, in this area. Uh, people are living in shacks and in trailers, and uh, but, uh, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Yeah, with COVID, it's only going to get worse. Mm-hmm. 
We'll just have to be innovative. <laughs> That's true. That's right. And uh, I know one thing I'm hoping for, I, I sort of re I remember back in 2008, 2009, and uh, the Obama was, as the candidate, was promising card check and labor law reform so that uh, we could get rid of a lot of the obstacles to union organizing. Unfortunately, we had too many pro-corporate Dems uh, that killed that whole possibility. I hope with a lot of the, the progressive gains in the, uh, in the recent elections, we'll, we'll, have, we'll be looking at a different situation and we can actually, assuming we get Trump out and uh, yeah. uh, elect a lot of new progressives uh, into the Democratic Party, uh, perhaps we can uh, actually make this leap this time because the obstacles to union or organizing, even when you've got majorities, you know, wanting to unionize, it just becomes really, really difficult. Anyway. Yeah, that was the Employee Free Choice Act, or EFCA. And I personally had some uh, concerns with it because uh, I thought it might open the door for unions to raid other unions. I mean, uh, may I ask you a question, Dan? Sure. Can you, I don't, that, that's something I don't know about, if you can elaborate on that, on the whole rating issue. Um, there have been unions that have actually left the AFI, uh, FL CIO so that they could do that very thing. Uh, I won't mention that union because uh, I don't want to, um, <laughs> I don't want to uh, get anybody upset, but um, they did uh, leave so that they could, um, get members from other unions to join their union. And uh, that, as you know, the FL-CIO uh, frowns upon. And uh, so that was my own, only concern. It may have been, um, it's one of those issues that's an unintended consequences. It may have not have happened. It may have been an issue uh, looking for a problem, but um, that was my concern. Moving on, uh, can you describe your dis uh, dis district Natalie, in terms of demographics, is it uh, middle class? Ed just said that there are a lot of poor people. Um, it is middle class retired. Uh, it's a mixed bag. We do have a lot of very low income families here. Um, and we have a lot of elderly people that are struggling to live on their social security. Um, every child in our district qualified for free lunch. Um, wow. So that should give you an idea of what we're looking at as far as families. And what I've noticed when I went out just trying to get signatures to get on the ballot, where there were people living in conditions that were not acceptable uh, without running water, uh, without proper, proper toiletry or heat. Um, you know, but then you have a lot of people moving here from out of town, out of state, and they're living in very nice houses. There are people who have always lived here who live in nice houses. I live in a nice house. Um, and then, you know, it's mixed and, and you have to pay attention to all the people, not just, uh, those people who, who can benefit you, but the people that you, you can help because they clearly need it, and a lot of them are too proud to ask for it. Unfortunately, a lot of them are Trump supporters, which is another reason that um, education oh, is no. top of my list, right? <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was inappropriate. I probably should have said that. So even in the labor movement, there are people that uh, they focus on an issue like guns or something like that and ignore the issues that are bread and butter issues. And right. I've, I've never understood that, but uh, to each his own, I guess. Well, you know, all we can do is reach out to them, and uh, I can't hear you. I'm not saying anything. Oh. We must have lag, because I saw you talking, but I couldn't hear yeah, you. Yeah, 20 seconds. Oh, okay. So we're almost done. Did you have any other questions for me? Yeah, um, Natalie, are you labor's obvious choice? And if you are, why should they endorse you and help you get elected? Well, 
Uh, am I a labor's obvious choice? My opponent would uh, definitely be a worse choice than me. So if they were <laughs> going to endorse someone in my community, I would be the obvious choice. Uh, I support workers and what they stand for, and I am an excellent ally for the labor movement. So if they were to choose me, I would gladly accept their endorsement, although I don't think that I actually got it. I did apply, um, and I haven't heard back from them. You know, I don't know if I'm an important race to them, but if I am, I'd be happy to have them, and I would do my best um, for the people as an ally of the labor movement. A lot of times... Go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, as, as far as I know, uh, I know that the state AFL-CIO is still deliberating, so yeah, I don't think they're done with their process. You know, I'm, I'm actually quite hopeful that that yeah. we will receive, uh, you know, the, the two, I get, you know, a couple of the major union endorsements in this area, which would be the state Fed, uh, AFL-CIO, as well as SEIU. So we're hopeful. Okay. Very good. And when is the election? The election's in November, same time as the presidential election. Wow. On the ballot. Surprised they're dragging their feet on this then. Um, let me ask you uh, just a couple more questions, Natalie, if I may. If you win, or I, sh I should say when you win, what will be the first piece of legislature that you'll introduce? Um, I don't know what the first piece of legislature I will introduce is, but as soon as I decided to run, uh, this is a local issue. Um, they made vaccines mandatory for all school students and took away their religious and philosophical objective. Uh, and that left online schooling not available to the taxpayers' children. And there is a legislator in Orno, and I'm going to get behind him and support him in allowing those students who opt out of vaccines to still be able to take the online school option. Uh, after that, there are so many issues that I do want to tackle. I don't know that I'll tackle any of them alone. Uh, I plan to collaborate with other lawmakers and see what we can get done. Have you received any endorsements from uh, other elected officials? Um, I don't know if they've endorsed me, but there are a lot of elected uh, state representatives who are supporting me, reaching out to me, asking people to help me and available for advice and really sort of pulling for me. Um, I don't even really know what, like I said, I, I never planned on me being a politician, so I don't understand the importance of endorsements. Mm. <laughs> people tell me it's important, but I don't really know what it means uh, yet. So. Yeah. That's what we call your base. Your base is the people that will be there for you no matter what. Come hell or high, high water. So building a base is really important in order to make you seem viable to all the other people that are sitting on the fence. Right. Well, then I guess I do need people from the labor movement. And uh, no, maybe I should ask some of them for an official endorsement. You should. You should. Yeah. Have you got a website or anything yet? I do. You'd like I do to share with us? It's uh, oh. nataliedepentino.com. And uh, I do have an Act Blue account on there. If you know anybody right. who might want to help me out there, that's, that's on there. Yeah. It is, aside from the obvious, as far as needing funds, is there anything that we can do or that labor can do to help you get elected? Yes, if I could get some volunteers to help me phone bank, um, because I am going to attempt to knock doors safely because my opponent is, uh, but there is no way that I can, in this rural community, reach all of the doors. And a lot of people may be afraid to open their doors because like I said, there are a lot of elderly people. Um, I need help with phone banking. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but yeah. yeah. Um, I need help phone banking so that we can reach all the members of the community and the voters, uh, not only letting them know I'm running and introducing myself to them, but reminding them that they need to get out and vote, encouraging them to vote by mail, and really kind of get them going so their vote gets out there and it matters. Well, you'll find that um, you coming to someone's door is actually going to uh, make them want to vote for you because they'll never, 
never have seen a politician before. <laughs> so, and if they're poor and they can't afford to contribute to your campaign, ask them to put in a couple hours on a weekend making some calls to their friends and neighbors. And when you do it, don't wear, don't wear sunglasses because you want them to be able to look in your eyes because yeah. if they look in your eyes, they can see exactly who you are. And how sincere you are. And especially, and, and how sincere you are. And especially since you're going to be wearing a mask, you don't want to wear glasses too. <laughs> I don't so, even know. Otherwise, sunglasses. you'll just look like the bandit. Yeah, I won't wear sunglasses. Right. There, okay, and um, now, do you have any, are there any questions from our chat line that you may want to ask Natalie? Uh, let's see if we, what we've got on there. Do you see anything on on uh, the chat line there, Ed? No, there's nothing there. It says there's okay. only three participants. It's just us right now. Yeah, but that's just on um, that's on Zoom. That's it on Zoom. It doesn't show us who's on uh, Facebook Live. So, uh, well, um, you want to give that website one more time? It's nataliedipincino.com. It's all little letters, so you don't have to worry about the two capitals. It's, <laughs> it's nataliedipencino.com. And um, my son built it for me. So. All right. Well, we wish you the best of luck. Please keep us uh, um, informed on how it's going. I will. I will. And thank you for having me. And once you get your list together, as far as uh, the voters in your area and you need us to help phone bank, let us know because that's what cell phones are for. That's wow. true. Wow, thank you. I appreciate it. Anybody that. can call anywhere. Yeah. Do you have any I, final I words, Joanna? Any, any, any final words? No. Just, your um, head? I your hope head? Thank I you hope for inviting you. us. Sure. Yeah. Um, this is from the Global Trade Union Assembly. It says, can you help us build U.S. participation? Uh, I've registered for the Global Trans U Trade Union for a pro-public future. The first people from countries like Nepal, Sri Lanka, some countries with uh, Argentina and Colombia taking the lead. Because of time zones, the sessions are going to be early in the morning, uh, 7 to 9.30 a.m. Eastern time, which means an even earlier start time for those of us here on the uh, West Coast. But in places like Australia, Korea, and India, the start time for the sessions is going to be late in the evening. It's a, a rare opportunity for trade unions to all get together from at all levels in all countries to extend, uh, exchange experiences and ideas, much like we're trying to do here. There will also be Spanish and French interpretation for those unions with uh, a high percentage of uh, folks that speak uh, one or both of those languages is um, S-W-E-E-N-E-Y-G-L-I at gmail.com. Um, today's disgruntled union member may actually be... And uh, they, they had very personal stories or didn't follow up with him. Um, sometimes it's a minor thing and, and it leads to uh, irritation, annoyance, uh, and eventually can uh, fester into something that uh, is going to hurt the labor movement in general. So that's really important. Uh, I knew a lot of uh, what... Um, Natalie is going through because I've run for office three times myself, uh, always hoping to be the labor candidate. But uh, in most cases, I was running against a congressional staff person, and uh, they take all the air out of the room, and, and uh, even labor would get behind them. And I sort of understood it uh, from a philosophical point of view because uh, they knew that they didn't have to support me if by uh, some fluke I did get elected they knew that I would vote the right way. Uh, with the, the congressional staffer, uh, they got uh, a win-win because they would be supporting uh, somebody from a congressperson's staff, which would make the congressperson happy and also um, allow uh, them to carry on their legacy with somebody else coming up uh, in the ranks behind them. So in a practical point of view, that made a lot of sense and I understood and don't, uh, um, don't f feel uh, like uh, that uh, I was deserted by the labor movement. Um, our next speaker is going to be on in about six minutes. Uh, let's go with another suggestion. Um, be on the lookout for the next generation. The ones with all the fire and 
and raw edges. Groom your successor and let them uh, make small mistakes because anybody, uh, Teddy Roosevelt said that if you're leading, you're not making mistakes, you're not really leading because you're not trying new things, you're not trying to, like this, like this uh, webinar, this is brand new for me. And as you can see, we've already made some mistakes on uh, technically that uh, how it should be done. But uh, we hope that uh, people are watching and listening and, and getting ideas on how we can uh, bolster the labor movement. I'm looking uh, to get more ideas from those that I talk to after this uh, webinar is over. And I uh, really hope that uh, people take this to heart and realize that uh, we're down to 10.5% in the uh, global, uh, in, the, uh, in the private sector and a little higher in the public sector. And I know some people have problems with, with public unions like teachers and police and, and fire, but uh, those are all crucial services. They usually, in, in, the, uh, in regards to police and fire, they have uh, a no strike clause. So, that puts them in a dis, the state a disadvantage when it comes to negotiating a new contract. Um, do you have a one that yeah. you? Uh, and guys, and I don't know who on the internet or who on Facebook Live or any of our viewers, if you're union stewards. Um, I have a suggestion. All of the years that I was a steward and that I would go in and uh, fight for our members' rights and and fight grievances and even as a vice president, there was not one time that I actually lost a grievance. And it's because when I approached the grievance process and went into the room to deal with management, I went in there as if I were fighting for my own job, not somebody else's job, but my own. Because what happens to those people, to the members, the ones that you're fighting for is a reflection on yourself. So you want to go in there and you just, you, you want to put up the best argument possible. It's like being a defense attorney. You want to go into the courtroom and, and, and you want to make sure that that person is considered innocent and gets what they want and, and gets their freedom and gets, and in this case, you know, with the grievances, you know, they want to be proven innocent. They want their money, you know, back pays and so on. One of the complaints that we've heard all, time and time again is that the union only represents troublemakers, uh, the ones that are always uh, doing the wrong thing or, or um, causing all sorts of uh, problems at the office. Uh, but that's not always the case. And um, the troublemakers uh, need to be represented also. Uh, in the union movement, there's something called, uh, actually in the National Labor Relations Act, there's something called denial of fair representation. So uh, that uh, makes the union have to represent each and every member at the best of their abilities. If that means getting a, a troublemaker off again and again, it's uh, on management's side that the problem is happening because they're not creating a paper trail and not uh, uh, showing a, a clear path to, uh, to discipline or even uh, having the employee fired. So uh, if, if they do their homework, there's not a lot uh, that the union can do because they set up a clear case. But in most cases, um, the management either doesn't want to do that because they really like that employee, even though they're a troublemaker, or they just don't want to do their homework because frankly, creating a paper trail is time consuming, but it's important if you're really getting rid of a, a problem uh, employee. And I don't want to stress that too much because my job is to, to represent an advocate and be a, an advocate for the, uh, the member. So that's our important job as labor and uh, wages, hours, and working conditions are the three bases of our uh, abilities. Here's do important work helping unions and employers find common ground in negotiations when it looks like talks are doomed to failure. They're often called in to win, to find a win-win settlement in cases of discipline or termination. They're supposed to be an impartial voice, somebody from the outside looking in, but it's always good to find somebody who leans your way. <clears throat> Bob Oberstein has over 48 years 
labor relations experience on both sides of the table in both the private and public sectors. He has been officially recognized for actively promoting positive labor management relations, something I call win-win negotiations. Bob was a third generation union member working his way through college as a member of the retail clerks, warehousemen, and confectioners union, which uh, later became the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, UFCW. And uh, later he went through an apprentice program with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and became active in his local, serving on various committees and as a member of the bargaining team. There's so much more to Bob's experiences and expertise, but we really want to hear what Bob has to say. For those who are interested, bios and other info will be on the Facebook page. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Dan. How are you? All right. Thanks. Um, we'd love to hear what words of wisdom you can give us about uh, what works and what doesn't work with unions. Well, um, if you're talking about rebuilding the labor movement, um, and is that possible? And, and that sort of thing. Uh, I, you know, after 48 years, I have observed a thing or two. Um, and, and keeping with that rebuilding question, um, it, it's common in labor history to talk about the house of labor. And so using a home construction analogy, uh, I, I think we need to ask, uh, are we talking here about a remodeling? Uh, just a few rooms, maybe uh, putting some siding up on the outside? Or are we talking about a ground up, get rid of the foundation, create a new foundation, because it was not well done to begin with, and now the house is tilting, uh, so uh, or unsafe to be in. So I think that's the first question labor's got to ask itself, uh, what has been working and what hasn't been working. Um, because those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Um, life's experience will tell all of us that. Uh, <clears throat> so keeping with that house analogy for just a minute, one of my labor side mentors described a decades long infighting between the AFL and the CIO before they merged in 55 as two brothers having a fist fight in a house that's burning down around them. And lots of time, resources, and energy were wasted because they were focused on the infighting instead of collaborating to achieve common goals. And there's plenty of that that goes on in society in general, plenty of that that goes on uh, in organizations, and certainly the labor movement hasn't been immune from it. Uh, but it, so it's good that they're asking the question because that's the first step. Um, but another and this time it was a management side mentor who told me, no resources are spared when the new need for illusion is great. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so. Interesting quote. Yeah, it is. I, I, I may try to copyright that and get it on t-shirts. I'm not sure. <laughs> but the, the question then becomes, you know, how can labor, if it's going to rebuild, avoid any illusion mindset and focus on solid results by putting co their collective resources together where they'll do the most good for joint priorities. And, and that almost simultaneously begs a second question, which is whose priorities are we talking about and what are they? So let's stay with the house analogy for just a minute longer. And um, you know, ultimately what's that house of new house of labor? What, what could it look like? What are the possibilities? And you know, remember, that they say a camel is a horse put together by a committee. <laughs> and while a camel may be preferred in a desert, it's not adaptable for all environments. You're not gonna want it in a swamp. Uh, while labor on the other hand, you know, to be truly sustainable and to withstand the whims of economics, politics, and culture, it needs to look, if it's gonna look at new models, it needs to look at a model that will sustain it through all of that or most of it or mitigate some of that. So 
the first observation I've had to make in 48 years of, of doing this, and, and I'm third generation, so even when I was visiting relatives and sitting on the stoops of uh, the apartment building in New York where I grew up, I'd hear stories about the union management, the strike, and that sort of thing. So it's 48 years plus, but basically labor has had some of its success tied to its codependency on three relationships. You know, one is with the employers, one is with the government, and the third is with political parties. And I'm gonna explain these one at a time. So uh, it's clear where I'm coming from. Um, I know it's strange to say that um, labor is codependent upon employers, but it's been said that no employer has a union that isn't uh, that hasn't worked real hard to deserve one. And the flip side of that is if because of limited resources, labor has limited its organizing mostly just to those organizations or employers where winning an election may be easier, it also means that labor is settling for the scraps left by only the most egregious employers. And in short, labor's been in large part pinning its success and thereby being codependent on what employers are not doing, instead of focusing on perhaps what employees and the unions can do for each other, regardless of what the employer does or doesn't do. And I realize that's, that's out of the box. Um, I gave a presentation on that once to a, uh, a group at UCLA, uh, mostly union folks, and they looked at me like I had eight heads. But uh, in all the years I've been out there in the field practicing, I haven't seen anything to dissuade me that that's really the, what needs to be done in the future. Now that second codependent relationship is with the government. And um, that's because labor's approach is, has been, and it's a good approach, it's noble, to do the most good for the many, which it has done in, in, in large part through legislation. The downside of that is that if folks' wages, hours, working conditions, and benefits are received and protected, not through the union, but through the government, then at least for those items, the question always becomes, well, why should I join a union? I've already got that. Basically, labor has given away the milk for free. So why buy the cow? Um, well, that seems to be the stand that uh, uh, the Wobblies, the inter industrial workers of the world take that we shouldn't uh, be bargaining direct, well, well, no, they're saying government should stay out and that we should do, bargaining should be between the employer and the, uh, and the union, right? Well, to an extent, I think uh, it doesn't have hurt to have controls. If you get to an impasse uh, place to say, well, now wait a second, you've got to have good faith bargaining. You know, somebody has got to be the referee in that process. Right. Otherwise, otherwise, it can go downhill really fast, and it goes from the uh, conference room out to the street, and that's what we want to avoid. Exactly. Um, so, um, it's a, while it's, it's noble for labor to do that, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but it's, it has to be recognized that it's also self-defeating, because it's not sustainable in the long run. You know, uh, remember, legislation can always be changed by the stroke of a pen. Um, it, it's not carved in stone or written in blood. Um, but by the time you realize it's gone, uh, your base has been so severely weakened, you may not be able to reestablish that legislation in a timely fashion. And um, you're gonna have to start again from the ground up. And so, you know, a simple example of this is the pre-flight instructions that we all used to get from the flight crew when we, uh, when we flew, if people can remember back that far. Um, <laughs> And the flight crew would always instruct us to first make sure our oxygen mask was working and securely fastened before we turned our attention to those traveling with us, specifically our children. Uh, it's, it's really that simple. First, make sure you can function fully before attending to the needs of others. And um, I realize that may sound a little selfish, but it, you know, it's not going to do you any good if you're not in a position to help people. And it's fine to help people, but make sure that it's not at the sacrifice of your existence. Uh, the third codependency is with political parties. Now, last time I checked, the United States was the only democracy that did not have a labor party. 
And while a single uh, label, pardon? I said, ah. Uh. Yeah. And uh, while a single labor party doesn't assure unity among workers, uh, the current system, of depending upon the mixed motives and priorities of either the Republicans or the Democrats, has a long history of a diminished return on investment. Uh, many years ago, I heard a West Coast labor leader whose name escapes me um, describe this support as being like an addict because labor provides resources, support, and funds for the politicians and gets little in return, and then turns around and continues to do the same thing all over again. And, you know, it's here where I got to point out, you know, uh, it was Einstein who said to repeat her behavior and expect a different result is a definition of insanity. Right. And, and so um, I think we have to take a, you know, real hard look at that. Um, and, and labor has to ask itself, you know, is this really working for me? Um, am I really happy about this? Um, and I'd offer uh, an international example with the uh, Israelis. Um, years ago, in order to get health benefits in Israel, one had to be a member of the Labor Party, the Likud. And, and, um, and it was legislated that way. And then the legis and, and the Likud was the most powerful party in the Knesset, their, uh, their legislative body. And then the legislation changed for a lot of reasons, too, too broad and frankly, I'm not that well versed to get into, but the legislation did change. And when it changed, the l people were able to get health benefits someplace else. And the Labor Party support and membership diminished and their political support within the country diminished. They didn't have quite the clout they used to have. So th there's an example for you. Um, they're not a Western democracy, but they are a democracy. Um, and so the question becomes, what feeding labor's codependency uh, is this idealistic belief or projection that if they do good for others, they'll receive like behavior in kind? Um, you know, th that's like, given the kid who's the toughest kid in the class, your lunch money or your lunch every day and expecting that tomorrow is gonna be different. That he's gonna tell you you can keep it. It's not gonna happen. Um, and that goes back to what Einstein said. So in short, it, you know, if history was a play, labor would have to take the part of Tennessee Williams Blanche Dubois and say, I've always relied on the kindness of strangers. And just like Blanche, it doesn't work. Um, and it didn't work for her. And, um, you know, a, a classic example of this is the duty to fairly represent. And when unions uh, will uh, feel that they, uh, the legislation from the Taft-Hartley Act, uh, that uh, they said, you know, if people only uh, would allow us to represent even the non-members, they will feel so emboldened to, so not so emboldened, so indebted to us that uh, for having represented them, that out of the goodness of their hearts, they'll join up. Uh, you know, that, that, that's a nice sentiment. I, I, I don't disagree with it as a sentiment, but it's only a sentiment. It doesn't work in reality. And um, uh, this may be very radical to say, but I think in a sense, um, Janus now, the result of the Janus decision is that it's put at least public sector unions in a position where they can um, not have to always represent those people, or if they do, they can charge for those services. I think that's more accurate. Um, and so now there's a, an investment into the union and there's a question about membership. Uh, so that may be a small, very small silver lining for the labor unions to Janus. But even if that sometimes works short term, this, this altruism, this noble gesture of the unions, it's not sustainable long term. Um, so, but what is sustainable is independence. Like I said, between the membership and the organization, not necessarily up based on what the employer or the government does or doesn't do. Um, so based on that, to succeed in the future, labor might want to consider. I don't know if any of what I'm about to say is the answer. It's certainly not the truth, the light, and the way, but it may be something to start a conversation. Um, 
to be more independent and stand on its own feet by ridding itself of these codependent relationships and how to do that. So consider this example. In the right to work state of Arizona back in the 1980s, and I realize a lot of people think that I'm talking about when we wore skins and discovered fire, but um, where public sector unions had no rights in the community college district. So the, the state allowed for, like the city of Phoenix, um, they had a, a, a little labor relations act and they allowed for union organizing and they had a kind of like an NLRB uh, or a version of it and, and that sort of thing with arbitration, mediation, what have you. Uh, the community college district didn't want any part of that. And I was with the part-time faculty association, basically people who were teaching a class here or there just to um, uh, make some money on the side. But some people were what we call freeway flyers and they were teaching classes in two or three, maybe more community colleges in the course of a week because that was their income. That was how they made their living, uh, even though their work was part-time. And instead of bargaining, we had meet and confer, which we used to kid around and say it was more like meet and confer. Um, and we had 36 dues paying members uh, out of hundreds. Um, and uh, and it's, the association was called the Part-Time Faculty Association. Dues was a whopping $10 a year. Um, but we didn't wanna you know, make it uh, unachievable for anyone. And we recognized along the way that there was an unmet need for both the employer, uh, the community, community colleges and the part-time faculty. And that need was filling part-time positions in a timely fashion. And for adjunct faculty to know where those openings were so they could apply. Now this is before the internet. Today you just have to get on the website, hit jobs, see what's out there and uh, drag and click your resume, your application, it'll self-populate and you're done. But in those days, you had to call every single college every week to find out where the jobs were. That's um, like a hiring hall concept. Uh, exactly. And coming from construction, and I was a president at the time, we borrowed the hiring hall concept, which was unusual for academia. And um, what we did was recognizing that need, we took the hiring hall concept. We got a volunteer who uh, contacted each one of the HR departments at the community colleges on a weekly basis on the days that they would post and compile where all these jobs were. And then people could contact us and get that information. There was only one catch. You had to be a member. And uh, the information was only available to those who had paid dues. And the volunteer was also somebody who collected the dues. So once we got the word out to the part-timers, they were only too happy to pay the $10 membership fee and to be counted as a member within three months, our ranks grew to over 400 members. Very good. Yeah, so, but the lesson here is that um, if people, if you're not meeting people's needs and you're not bringing them into the organization based on those needs and you're giving it away, there's really no need for them to join up and support the effort. Um, and some folks did try and get it for free and they were turned away. And I have to say that was hard to do, um, but the alternative was to cut our own throats and uh, it didn't make everybody a labor convert. I think that's really important because some of these people, even though they pay the $10 fee, they still weren't quite where they needed to be in terms of being a, um, a died in the wool union member. Um, the, uh, in fact, one fellow continued to constantly call me and he was a dues payer uh, to tell me what he thought the organization needed to work on and where I needed to focus my efforts. And when I repeatedly invited him to attend meetings to state his case, he consistently begged off as stating that he was unable to attend Saturday meetings because it was his, and I'm quoting now, his tanning day. You know, so, you know, the lesson here, his invaluable message is that for too many of us, our needs and priorities take precedence over those of the group. And so you can't expect the group to meet your needs if you're not going to help the group. And the group can't expect you to want to do that unless they're going to meet your needs. It's a symbiotic relationship. 
And, and, but that will always be labor's biggest challenge, as it is with many, many other organizations. And, you know, before I get to the punchline, McCursey, uh, who's a, an academic, Robert McCursey, uh, cited four stages of unionism. And I have to say as a caveat, these are correct for any organization that I've ever been in, in touch with or had a relationship, but he used, uh, he, he isolated these based on unionism. And the first stage is revolutionary. And I don't think that needs any uh, explanation. You're taking something that was X and you're turning it into Y. Uh, the second stage is uplift, and this is the negotiating the benefits, the um, right to bargain over wages, hours, working conditions, the grievance process, etc. The third is business, and this means business as usual. Things are just kind of humming along. They're not moving forward. They're not falling behind. They're just kind of there. And the fourth is predatory, and I realize that might get the uh, hair on the back of some people's necks uh, uh, to raise up a little bit, but that's what he called it. And it means existing just for the sake of existence. And that's what he was talking about. And um, it should go without saying this, that these stages apply to other organizations as well, including management, I gotta tell you, because uh, I've been on that side of the table and I've seen that happen. So the question though becomes in light of those four categories, how can labor rebuild to stay in the revolutionary uplift zones while simultaneously avoiding the business as usual and the predatory stages. And that, that's a challenge for any organization. But consider what might happen if, just before somebody goes out to start working, hmm, teenagers, 14, 15, 16, depending upon the state you live and depending upon whether or not they need working papers, they got an introduction to the workplace from the various governmental agencies and sponsored perhaps by the local labor force, uh, labor union, central labor council, as to what their rights are gonna be in this workplace that they're about to go into for the rest of their lives. And certainly sexual harassment, bullying, what the law states about disabilities, should any of those kids have any, um, and, um, the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, what kind, what, when can they ask for overtime, what the boss has to pay them, what is the minimum wage, and also their Section 7 rights in terms of private sector organizing, or depending upon what that state's law is, uh, public sector organizing, and the right to be represented. And of course, if it's possible, you open these classes up to parents as well, maybe you give them at the end of the day or in the evening. And uh, it's all done gratis, but perhaps through the high school. So what you're doing is you're making soldiers, but you're also equipping those soldiers with the bullets, with the information that they need. Otherwise, where are they gonna find this out? They're gonna find it out only after they've been uh, on the receiving end of some of this or some violations, and if they have the wherewithal to go to the internet. Why not arm them right up front, or at least plant those seeds right up front? Additionally, what might happen if people got their benefits? Cradle to the grave benefits, not from the employer or the government or some combination, but from the union, right from the get-go. And they would have the mobility to maintain those benefits, regardless of where they worked, provided it was in a union shop. Um, when I used to teach management classes, I'd have 25 to 35 HR types in the class. And I would ask them this question, and I would ask them, if I had an organization that could guarantee you that for the rest of your working life, would you join? And every hand in the class went up. Um, so th that's, those are the bread and butter issues. Um, uh, the other thing is training people. Where, where do people go to get trained? Well, they go to colleges, they go to vocational schools, they go to um, you know, the military. But some of that training, especially the um, uh, adult level training and education can be, if not offered by the unions, it can be in the long term subsidized by the unions. I, I, I just finished up another master's degree in um, 
labor and employment law. And the, um, my employer only paid $4,000 a year, but the cost to me was $10,000 a year or more. So what would happen if the union had a program that subsidized the rest of that? Would people suddenly want to join? And it's a question. Um, the other thing I'll leave you with, uh, uh, and then I'll shut up, is uh, something that uh, one of my mentors back in New York City started for a while, and then it petered out for a variety of economic reasons. He called it the Worldwide Organization. And they actually did this with uh, Gestetner, the printing company out of Germany that made printers. Um, and there were people who repaired those machines. And they tried to get support in Germany when they were trying to organize the people in New Jersey and in New York City. So uh, you mentioned the Wobblies earlier, the IWW and the worldwide organization. Well, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There is something to be said for bringing economic pressure on a global basis when you're dealing with a global employer or uh, an employer that has a parent company. And uh, you, you have to do it legally, um, but you can do it. And especially in this day and age with the internet and uh, Yelp and everybody having an opinion, people, are, thank goodness, we're never short on our opinions. There's always um, uh, an opportunity. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a very familiar story, Sunkist, uh, changed how it farmed tuna be, uh, uh, to make it dolphin safe because of the letter of a young elementary school student who wrote in and said that she thought it was terrible that these dolphins were perishing because of the way uh, uh, Sunkist was um, uh, farming the, uh, the sea. And because uh, they knew there's a future consumer there. So there's a lot of tools out here. There's a lot to think about, but um, you know, I, I hope this will get people thinking. And like I said, these may not be the answers. Uh, certainly I'd be surprised if any of them were, but uh, they can be the start of a conversation. Okay, if I can address some of the things that you brought up. Um, you had said, uh, what if we had our healthcare come through a union. Um, if, you're, if you're changing industries, however, and you're moving on to something else, um, would that travel with you? Or have you uh, thought this through about how that would uh, be affected if you moved into a totally different area than that union that previously represented you? Well, in the short term, if I went into a totally different area, that wasn't unionized, um, it could mean that I might have to give up those benefits or maybe like um, uh, the government does today, uh, I could continue to purchase perhaps at a discount, but there's also an opportunity there to organize. Um, so, so now that I'm in a new area, maybe my coworkers would like better benefits. And so, Maybe, uh, you know, uh, in order to keep my benefits, um, I need to work hard to organize them. Okay, what if you're um, a phone company worker and you're represented by CWA and then you end up going over to uh, work for IATSE and uh, building sets? Totally different industry. Um, I guess going from one union to the other, they would pick up your benefits at that point. From, uh, from what you're saying? They could, they could, it, you know, it depends. Uh, you know, um, if, if just one local union or one international, mm -hmm. the, let's say for argument's sake, does some of this with the health benefits, um, you know, <laughs> obviously it's going to have its limits. But on the other hand, if the uh, international one international and another related international. Um, so maybe the IBW and the CWA and related unions get together um, 
and ultimately under something like the AFL-CIO, um, or maybe there's just a union benefits program without all the unions buy into that's administered for any union member so that they have mobility. Now that, that's gonna be up to the labor movement to figure that out. Uh, but I don't think it's impossible to figure out. It's a question of how do you structure your business model? That's true. Do you see us um, ever having a labor party or is that uh, <laughs> idea gone by the wayside? Well, there's always a possibility. Never say never. Um, and, uh, but it, it's going to take uh, an awful lot of, and, and this may be, I'm finding it surprising that I'm saying this uh, right now, it's going to take more disillusion than we currently have with the current political party system. And, and I, I, yeah, it, it's, it's gonna be hard, it always has been hard um, because of the alignment of the Democratic Party to a lot of the labor goals. But, um, and I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't see how that might happen or could happen. Um, I, I, I don't have um, the, the ability of, um, I'm forgetting the character now from Asimov's Foundation series, uh, Harry, somebody who was able to, through mathematical algorithms, predict the future and how to mitigate certain things. I, I don't have that ability, um, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, and, and look, any labor party or any political party is going to have its, um, its vulnerabilities just because they're made of, of people. And, you know, and, and um, you know, I always get a kick out of people who say, well, labor's got a lot of corruption in it. Every time I pick up the paper, I'm reading about this or that labor leader who, you know, had his finger in the pot here and there and that sort of thing. Well, that, yeah, that's true. But have you ever heard of Enron? Uh, you know, there's, a, there, there's an awful lot of uh, corruption that goes on throughout society. And you can't just say that, you know, it's limited just to the political parties or compromising or trading this for that because it's a marketplace. Um, but I have hope. Very good. Um, in uh, researching my book, Capitalism Kill the Middle Class, uh, there was, uh, I found that uh, in 1894 at the American Federation of Labor Convention, Samuel Gompers actually uh, said, we don't need a labor party. And about the same time in Australia, uh, in, actually in 1901, uh, Australia Labor Party was the very first, even before England. And uh, I always w wonder what was going on in Samuel Gopper's head that he didn't want to go down that route. Yeah, I, you know, and I can only guess, um, but I think the answer in a word is pragmatism. You know, he could um, start from the ground up with a labor party and uh, he might have to fight both the Republican and the Democratic parties, <laughs> but um, he could choose that path uh, and maybe succeed, or he could choose, and, it, and that's the, kind of like a, a three front war because you got the two political parties who were allied uh, against the, uh, a common, uh, not wanting a third party coming in. And, the, and then you have, um, all of the people you're trying to organize uh, to be also in agreement with that. And so I said three, uh, a three front war, but it, it's probably more multiple than that. Right. Or, or you can choose to uh, make friends with the, uh, the people you have to work with. And, and that's just the two of them and try and get them to work uh, and court the labor vote. Uh, and, and the support of labor. Uh, and so from a pragmatic standpoint, um, it, it makes short term sense. You know, and but I think you're making a great point here. Maybe in the evolution of labor in the United States and across the globe, maybe, you know, you start off with observing short term gains. And maybe you keep doing it's kind of like an ER, you know, people come in and they're triaged and you stop the bleeding here and stop the bleeding there and, you know, give somebody oxygen. 
But now let's talk about long-term care and let's talk about not just treating the disease, but curing it or preventing it. Very good. So do you th think uh, um, militancy has a place in the labor movement anymore? Um, well, I I'll give you a personal perspective. and This is how I run my life. Uh, militancy of thought is fine. Militancy of action is permissible as long as it brings no harm. So if I want to protest something, I, I tend to be uh, I, uh, from the school of Gandhi. Uh -huh. You know, it, it's fine if, you know, if I want to protest something, I can protest it through um, a, a fasting, a, a, um, uh, a silent protest. And I was pleased to see recently across America where some of this went on, um, as opposed to something that's, you know, militancy to me triggers a, a, an image of violence. And uh. so, um, you know, but I think there's nothing wrong with strength of heart and commitment. And, um, and I think that's where a labor, the labor movement can um, pick up a lot of uh, juice and um, uh, a lot of support by by and get results but that takes sacrifice and it takes a long time and it doesn't happen overnight and sometimes people you know they, they don't have the patience um you know that the, the, they want something and they want it now that wasn't referring necessarily to the violent aspects of militarism but uh, sit down strikes uh things like that that walter ruther and the united auto workers did so long ago that uh, thanks to Taft Hartley are now uh, illegal. Um, maybe some of those uh, civil disobedience, those kinds of things, uh, are still being practiced somewhat. But uh, as I said, they're they're illegal now. And but uh, maybe we need to uh, put them back in our bag of tricks, so to speak. Um, well, you certainly don't necessarily want to do something that's unlawful, uh, but. Uh, civil disobedience is um, always an option um, as, as long as it's respectful of all the parties. Um, now, it, again, it, uh, no, nobody, if, if I'm being civil, civilly disobedient on an issue, I should never expect the other party to say, oh, wow, Bob missed lunch. I think we ought to just give in. Uh, you know, that, that's just not going to happen. Right. Um, uh, so it, it also depends upon using the uh, media. And I think good use of the media is um, very, very important. Um, and, and, and that's been underutilized by the labor movement. Well, let's talk about your career as an arbitrator. Um, uh, what led you down that path? Well, you know, I heard about the term arbitration and mediation when I was in um, third or fourth grade. The teachers in New York City had just uh, organized, and um, uh, I wasn't much of a student, and they, my parents came back from a parent-teacher conference, and um, uh, the te teachers uh, basically said, uh, we don't know what's going to become of him. Uh, yeah, he, he, he's not much of a book, uh, book learner, and, uh, but he gets along with all the other kids. And in the schoolyard, if there's a fight, you always see him in the middle trying to stop it. And uh, he can talk the birds out of the trees. Um, and I didn't realize then that, that was, those were qualifications for arbitration and mediation. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I really do think that... Um, the arbitration process, the mediation process uh, are um, uh, very productive in a relationship. Uh, not just labor management, employer, employee, but uh, I've done divorce and family mediation and community, community mediation and uh, for EEOC charges and, and that sort of thing. And um, it, it's a very useful process and it can stop the parties from wasting an awful lot of time going to court or and being dissatisfied. Um, 
because very, very often, even if they win, uh, you'll hear that it wasn't worth the time and effort and trouble. Is there anything during your long illustrious career in the uh, field of arbitration that surprised you or, or um, uh, opened your eyes somewhat to uh, another point of view? Um, boy, that's a good question. Uh, no, I, I'd have to say, uh, not through the arbitration process. Um, although, uh, I, I did uh, see something in mediation that was interesting once, and that was, um, an employer, um, and at the time, I have to say, I was teaching a class on apology and forgiveness in society. Huh. Uh, and that was as an outgrowth of what I observed in mediations that people, and across the bargaining table, very often people just didn't either apologize or know how to apologize or take an apology and or know how to forgive somebody and what forgiveness really meant. So uh, it was a very interesting course. In the middle of that course, I did a mediation for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And this was a, um, a black man who had been uh, fired. He had gone on uh, what he thought was some vacation and came back to find out that the vacation uh, was unapproved and he thought it had been approved and he uh, was fired. And by the time we got to mediation, he had moved on. He had another employer who was paying him more. And he, um, uh, we started off the mediation uh, with his employer. His, the employer's opening statement was an apology. I've never seen that before. And the employer apologized saying that he was on vacation at the time and his uh, fill-in, his, his uh, substitute, didn't look deeply enough into the records to see that he had approved the vacation and that oh. the termination was in error and they wanted to make this right. And, you know, at this point I'm sitting there going, so what am I doing here in a mediation? Why couldn't these two people have just talked about it? Uh, why, did, why, why, why did we have this formal process? And he, um, I mean, they wound up shaking hands and hugging by the time it was all over. Uh, in fact, he had been the best employee that the uh, manager had ever had. The manager actually was trying to get him back. Um, so uh, that was a surprise. Yeah. I think a lot of times uh, uh, management's afraid to apologize because of uh, possible uh, liability issues. Well, that's true. You know, the liability is a funny thing. One of the things I learned when teaching that class was that in the state of California, they, they actually had to pass legislation that said it was okay to get out of your car and apologize for hitting the other person without assuming liability. <laughs> Interesting. Well, you have some great stories, Bob, and I'd love to uh, hear more. And uh, if, if it's possible, I'd like to call on you again. Oh, absolutely, be happy to. Thank you very much for your time. And um, have a great day and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Oh, thank you to you for giving me the opportunity and thank you to your audience for listening. Thank you. Next, once he comes on, we'd like to introduce Joe, Joe Ayala. He is uh, the Vice President of the National, National Association of Broadcast Employees and Technicians um, from the CWA Local 53 in Burbank, California. And he should be on in just about one minute. There we go. Hey, right. can, you can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Good. I'm trying to figure out why we don't see you on. Let me come over here. To... I've got my video on. Should yeah, be... I think the problem is on my end, but uh... yeah, I'm see I'm seeing you guys, and I can I can see and hear you guys. Okay, let's see if I can fix this. I wasn't able to on the last one. But you could see him on Facebook Live. You just got to uh, see him on. Um... If we can see him on Facebook. I've got Facebook right here. 
have seen us, but uh, oh, there, there he are. is. Hi, Joe. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. I can't, actually, I can't see you. All I can see is uh, Dan, <laughs> Dan and Terry. There we go. So, um, uh, should I just go, should I, should I just jump into it? You have the floor, brother. All right. Uh, well, let me introduce myself. First of all, my name is Joe Ayala. I'm a uh, vice president of vice president of NAPIT Local 53. We're the, the National Association of Broadcast Employees and Technicians, as it says right here. Um, we're a uh, we're in the we're a broadcast union, so we represent most of the broadcast sector. Um, bigger, you know, mostly uh, the the O and O's uh, own, owned and operated stations of the networks uh, NBC, ABC. Um, uh, Fox, we represent them as well, Telemundo, uh, Univision here, um, but my local represents um, local TV stations with a couple of exclusions, ne uh, NBC and Fox are both networks, so we represent them as well. I've been doing this for about um, for about 10 years. I've been in office for, for almost, this is my 10th year actually in office. So I've been reelected to, um, to uh, vice president status for uh, four terms, um, which says a lot about me, but it also says a lot about my lack of participation in my union, which I'm going to get into right now. Um, and um, and I'm running for office. I'm running for. Uh, I'm actually running for a higher office. I'm running for mayor of Simi Valley. So I was asked uh, by my one of my city council women, who's a, a progressive Democrat, and uh, a couple of other uh, folks who are, you know, uh, in in the political structure here in Simi Valley, to uh, to run for mayor. So I've uh, decided to go ahead and do that. There's lots of reasons to do that, and I'm going to get into that later on. But but um, but I really truly do want to help people. I've I've done I've been doing this for a long time, and it's not for my own. Anybody who is an elected official will tell you that they get very little satisfaction uh, uh, monetarily or in in many other ways. It's mostly uh, you know people's complaints and worries, and we take those on and we and we help them out. I like doing that. Not it's not for everybody, uh, and I wouldn't you know I'm not going to encourage folks who have you know dissimilar interest to do that, but I would certainly say if you have an interest in helping people, you should always, you should consider running for office of any sort. But let me get into what I was going to say uh, and, and the reason Dan asked me to be on here. So I want to talk about, you know, we're talking about building um, union power and a couple of the things that I've, um, I sent Dan a list of things that I wanted to talk about today. And the first thing I want to talk about is internal organizing. With, um, within our own local and I can give you examples here, but but I have a, a really hit and miss uh, outreach with my members, and it's I, I do talk to as many people as I can. I mean, uh, the president and myself are very active as far as getting out there and meeting the meeting the members. We um, spend a lot of time doing that, but we're two people, and we're, we have uh, 1,800 members, so it's very difficult to reach everybody with any kind of like um, consistency. And it takes that because you really have to member to member have have members have to be talking to other members. They have to explain to them what's going on. What's the contract mean to them? What is uh, what does the contract mean to them as a whole? But just what does it mean to them personally? Um, there's a, there's a, a more than a few members, and I'm sure if there's a, a union um, brothers and sisters on this on this uh, Zoom meeting on Facebook Live, I'm sure you're gonna agree with me that there's a lot of members who don't know a lot of, of what the union does and uh, what, what their role is in the union and what they, uh, and what they should expect from, from uh, your representatives and from the contract, from your you know, individual contracts. So it's very important to have that kind of uh, um, internal, I mean, that's what I call internal organizing. When you're speaking to members about you know, their own issues, talking about you know, building up the union and making them aware and grateful that there's a union in, in their shop. Uh, and it also helps when you have groups as we do, who are, some are organized and some folks aren't. If the folks that are, that are organized talk, you know, you know, are you know, working hard and, and, and really sp uh, spinning the message, the folks that are not organized are gonna get that message and they're gonna wanna organize too. And that's how you build one of the ways you build power, you build strength in numbers. Unions have always been about numbers because we don't have the money that corporate interests have and big moneyed interests have. 
So we have to talk about numbers. Individual small dollar numbers add up to a lot, and that gives us some power. Because at the bo- you know the bottom line of all this stuff is if you don't have any kind of, you have to have an entity to represent people, and that costs money. Everything costs money. And, I'm, and trust me, I'm in the finance committee of my local, so we, <laughs> we, we deal with that a lot. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is community outreach. Uh, a lot of us are insulated. And I know that, uh, again, I'm going to speak uh, for myself and our own uh, union structure. There, there's not a lot of, of community outreach. We don't spend a lot of time. There are locals, and I will, I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, knock those guys because they're doing a great job. I, I know in Chicago, uh, one of our brothers over there um, is, uh, I mean, actually a few of our brothers over there, are very active in the community. They, they're, they're photographers at one of the TV stations or, you know, they do different things, but they're, but they get out there and they're really, you know, invested in the community. They have their, one of my friends uh, who's vice president of the local in Chicago, his wife is actually uh, sits on the city council of a small town in um, a suburb of Chicago. So they, they're, they're very active and, they're, and they, they get out there and they, they meet people. And that's very important for, for unions because we don't, really do a whole lot of of outreach some of us do but uh, a lot of us don't and that's important we need to we need to that's a that's a very important dynamic to remember because honestly we we are representatives of the community the folks that that are in the unions live in the communities that we that we work in usually or we commute it's i live in los angeles so yeah there's a lot of commuting you know maybe you don't live in the same town as you work in but you do spend money in the town that you know, wherever you earned it from, you're still spending money in your hometown. So that's it's important, and those are union dollars. So um, community outreach is very important. And I think it's um, a, you know one way to do it is um, you know beyond what my friend does, which is is getting out there and having he does a podcast and he reaches out to you know talks about not just union stuff. He talks about you know uh, if you're people going through hard times and that you know really it's about working people, and he doesn't put you know necessarily the big U on it. But it all comes down to the same thing. It's about working people. So um, anyway, and then external organizing. That's uh, kind of a no-brainer, I think, for most folks here. If you're if you're in a union, you know you have to grow because um, you know the uh, <laughs> the downside of that is you're going to you know diminish, and so you need to be actively seeking out um, you know new uh, new members, uh, new bargaining units. Folks that are, you know, and there's a lot of people who are needy. I, I know. I mean, I live in a state that's not a right-to-work state. We're an at-will state, but we're not a right-to-work state. That's good, that's good for unions. But having said that, you know, large corporations in Los Angeles are have no interest. Or I mean, actually, you know, companies in general have no interest in, in having an organized workforce by and large. Um, I want to say probably 99.9% of them don't would rather not see a union enter their their doors. But um, but it's important for pe- for working people to be organized because it's the only voice that you have. When you're speaking as an individual, you don't have, you know, you've got as much power as one person does. When you speak as an organized group, and like I said to my union brothers and sisters, you know the, the strength that lies in numbers. Um, and speaking of external organizing, uh, new workforces are important. We, um, in the broadcast industry, which I represent, there's been a, there's been a major shift in um, in the way that news is being delivered, content isn't just. I mean, this isn't a new thing, but it's been going and it's been going on for probably about 10, 15 years, possibly a little bit longer. But there's been an, um, um, you know a dynamic shift in um, in the way news is being news content is being delivered. So you know the old days of microwave dishes and satellite dishes and you know that, you know the terrestrial you know, lines and that kind of stuff. Those are those days are going away. Nowadays, the internet. Uh, supplants, supplements, and supplants a lot of the uh, the work that we were doing before. Now you can see that by the amount of, um, you know, your local newspapers that have closed down. I think I don't, I forgot how many closed down like two years ago. We had like two thousand local newspapers closed down two years ago. They were replaced by by uh, digital media. In some cases, they were gone completely, but uh, that's because of digital media. So we have to keep you know cognizant of that, and it's important to organize those guys because they tend they tend to be. You know, smaller organizations, but they also are, you know, very under, you know, underpaid by and large. They're not, uh, they're not working at any kind of standard. And it is a wild west right now. And there's really hasn't been a lot of organizing going on within um, um, the, on the internet in general. 
social media is very important. You want to get um, as much of your message out there as you possibly can. So ways we can do that on the on uh, inexpensively are um, through social media. I, I certainly post my my fair share of uh, of things that are union related and you know um, socially important in my opinion to uh, to people. And so uh, there's a lot of that. Um, outreach that comes from me, sometimes from the local, but it's another way of messaging that you can get, um, that you can, uh, another way of getting your message out uh, without having to spend a lot of money doing it. And, um, and lastly, uh, I wanna go into building political power. <clears throat> and this is really like the, or maybe I should have started there, but I, I think I kind of did, but I'm, I, I got off on a tangent, so. Come around full circle. We have, uh, <laughs> I do that all the time, but we have, um, a lot of really smart members in uh, in our union, and um, there's a lot of really smart. And I talked to I work in I, I uh, I'm a re, I'm a delegate to the County Federation of Labor here in Los Angeles. Uh, I have a lot of um, I've developed a lot of great friendships with folks like Dan and, and Terry and 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 um, uh, just folks in in the in the labor in the labor movement and in the um, social justice movement. And um, those things are tied together. And we have to remember that a lot of our guys think that you know it's my union or my local you know um, um, is you know that's it and everything else be damned. I'm gonna just focus on this, but you have to you can't do that. You have to focus. You have to remember that there's a world outside of the local. There's a world outside of your bargaining unit, and that 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 world is influenced by politics, and and your unit, your very bargaining unit, is influenced by by political pressure, by political legislation. And if you don't take an active role in it, you don't have to run for office, but you should at the very least be much more politically savvy about who you're voting for and what benefits or detriments they're gonna be to you. So, you, you know, a lot of our guys, and I, I really do love a lot of our Democrats. There's a lot of good Democrats in office that are, that are especially now. Um, I, of course, you know, I'm, I'm a huge AOC fan. If anybody knows me there, <laughs> they know I'm as far, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I was a Bernie supporter in 2016, and I was uh, this year as well, or last year as well. And um, I do believe that this country needs a big change, where the status quo is not enough. And uh, certainly, uh, under the uh, leadership of our current uh, uh, so-called administration, it's not helping anybody. So you guys have to get active. Run for office if you can, if you, if you, if you, if you have it within you. You don't have to be millionaires to run for office, especially down ballot. And I encourage you to do this. Don't worry about running for Congress. Don't worry about running for Senate. Don't worry about, you know, the presidency is so, you know, you've got to be a millionaire to be a president. And that's a fact. You've got to have a lot of money. You're not be a, you're, poor people just can't, it's, it's, the system is to be, to be a, you know, a gloom and doom guy. The system is kind of rigged in that way. But um, as far as that, but you, you don't start there anyway. I think that the most important legislations are made at home. And if you don't have a good, could county commissioner seat. If you don't have a good, um, you know, in my case, the mayoral seat is terrible. Our mayor in CV Valley is, you know, an awful, an awful person. I mean, he's just a bad person in general, but he doesn't do anything good for the city. And he certainly uh, is, he takes a very Trump approach to, to politics in our town. We have a very divided town. We, we, we have a, a, a good segment of, of race, a good, a good amount of racism in, in our town, which shouldn't exist, but it's encouraged by folks in our city council. It's encouraged by, you know, our mayor is like, well, you know, I wouldn't want to, you know, we should be, remember that all lives matter. It's very important. You know, these are guys who are not helping the situation. So I, you know, I, I want to run for mayor because of that, that, you know, I think we can make a better, we can be better representatives of our community. We can build bridges between people and we can and we can bring them together. Instead of trying to ostracize folks, we need to try and come together. It's, an, it's a small planet, man. And it's getting smaller every day. So we should try and remember that we all live in the same, <laughs> literally next door to each other. So anyway, uh, I encourage everybody to, to do that. I think it's, uh, I'm gonna wrap this up and, and just uh, leave it open to questions if anybody has any. But uh, please, if you, if you have it within you, you know, run for office or get involved politically in some way. You know, run for delegate. That's, Dan and I did that. Uh, as probably more than a few people on this call have done that as well. Um, and uh, we, you know, my second term as delegate, I think that, I don't know how many times Dan's been delegate to, to the, county, uh, to, um, to the uh, California Democratic Party. And you get, 
you know, much more information and much more clout when you're, when you're inv invested that deeply. It's not, in, it's, it's not free, but it's not unaffordable either. I think most people could probably do that. It, it doesn't cost a whole lot. And nowadays with the Zoom meetings going on, it doesn't cost really anything. You just have to be, you know, you pay your dues because the Democratic Party is a club and you've got to pay dues to be a part of it, you know, not just the voting. So um, yeah, get, in, get involved, please. Anyway, I'll leave it to you guys to uh, ask any questions you might have. Sure, you represent folks that work in the media. Uh, is there any kind of uh, blowback or whatever when they go out to cover events, um, um, like uh, the protests about having to wear masks and, and lot Oh yeah, that? are you kidding? We've been, I, I'm, I don't know if you guys have been watching a lot of the, 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 um, the events, the rallies and the, uh, especially when, you know, with the riots, that was the most, that was really the, the, the dangerous part mm -hmm. because while I think that a lot of the, the, the rioters were not necessarily part of the protest, they were folks who were opportunists who were taking advantage of the situation. Um, they certainly uh, put our, our media folks at risk. And I gotta say, here's the problem, uh, the, the real other part of the problem was we weren't really safe from the cops either. There's a more than a few uh, uh, of videos of um, our reporters and photographers getting shot at by, um, you know, uh, not gut, uh, what do you call those things, rubber bullets, um, pepper sprayed, um, tear gas. It's, uh, you know, because they're in the same area as the protesters. Right. So when they're, and depending on where you were, some of these guys were really, um, I mean, I'm not sure what the hell they were trying to do, really, because they were very, they were, I mean, the idea of, um, of coming down on some folks like as hard as they did was just appalling. But yes, there's been a lot of, and I got to say before this, um, you know, the media has been at risk for a while and it's been, you know, and I, I can, I can, you know, really blame uh, the man in, in the White House right now for a lot of this because he has made the media the target of scorn, of ridicule, you know, fake news. And don't get me wrong, I, I can get into that too if you want me to, because it's like, if you're talking about like where, you know, what the media does as far as like how they spin things, sure, in some ways, you know, you could say that they're not, it's not fake news. That's not happening. If anything, even Fox News, while they sometimes, and they, they do like make mistakes and they make, and they, they will say like literally a lie on, on the air, but they'll have to retract it later on. And a lot of that Fox News stuff, you have to remember, isn't actually news. It's like MSNBC isn't actually news per se. That's the, that's us. That most of them are political pundits. So it's opinion pieces, and a lot of folks don't understand the difference. They get into a. I think I got off in the weeds here, man. But they get into a, a thing where they're they're uh, they're talking their 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 opinions on things, and folks consider that to be news. And that's not news, but that's taken out of context. You go into the public, and all of a sudden, and Donald Trump is saying, you know, you're a terrible reporter. You're, uh, uh, you know, you're ridiculous. You know, you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're. A, a, what do you think the average American who's watching that, especially if he's a Trump supporter or maybe undecided or just a person who doesn't really trust things, you know, uh, that are going on right now? And a lot of folks have righteously don't trust things that are happening right now because there's a lot of bad things going on in the country and they're that and there are that are out of a lot of people's controls. Um, and that creates a lot of blowback. For folks that work in in, uh, in the media, and so uh, yeah, we have we've had some issues, and it's been going on for about four years now. It didn't just start because of the riots. Uh, how can labor get their story out in the media? How can what? How can labor get their more um, more? What's the word I'm looking for? More visibility in the media. Well, I was saying before that we need to get, um, we need to do more community outreach. I think we need to get out there and, and be visible. Marching in a protest, I mean, marching in a, in a um, let's give me an example, like we do uh, rallies when we're having uh, contract disputes. And those are good, and we should be doing those. It's important, it's part of the process, to make, it helps to bring, uh, it helps bring awareness that there's a problem going on at whatever given company. And so we get out there, we, you know, we have our, our, you know, we beat our drums, we have our whistles, we march up and down the street for a few hours, and then we get back to the table and start negotiating again. That's important, but it has to be more than that. 
we need to get, you know, when the community has a, a parade, uh, for instance, every year we have a, uh, maybe that, that uh, the Labor Day parade over in Wilmington. I, mm -hmm. I always, we always march in that. Labor marches in that. But we should march in other, like, hometown parades. We should be, you know, in smaller uh, venues, uh, events that are going to happen in your, in your community. If there's a, um, a, I don't know, a taco festival. If there's a, you know, like an Oxnard, we have a watermelon festival. We should have labor over there putting, um, you know, a booth and saying, hey, get involved. This is a good way to get into, in, into the labor mood. That, that would be a great way uh, to spread the message. And social media is also very important. I think that that is uh, uh, another way to, to another avenue of attack, so to speak, where you could like um, um, you know, saturate the market with more information and about unions and about um, you know the, the the positivity or the or the the gains of being in a union. Um, it's expensive to advertise. I mean, I no one, as far as I know, very few unions do that. But you know, not at all, actually. I remember the national campaign years ago, uh, look for the union label. Remember that song? Yeah. And that was on all the time. And I remember when it, when it went away, I said, oh, that's, that's too bad, you know? And it never came back. That kind of stuff cost a lot of money. And I'm sure that's one of the reasons why, it, why we didn't stop, we stopped the advertising. But a lot of the reasons also is, you know, big media isn't our friend. I mean, they're not friends of labor because big media unfortunately is owned by large corporations. I work for Telemundo. That's my, that's my, um, that's where I'm a director at, but we're owned by NBC, who's owned by Comcast, who's owned by, I don't know, God. So, you know, those guys don't, it, you know, it, it's not about, you know, and this is the part that I'm talking about when you're talking about, you know, journalists are good and they do their job and they're reporting the news and they're doing it right, you know, justified. The companies that we re represent, the companies that own the, 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 the media business are not good people, as most corporations aren't good people, because they're not people. And no matter what uh, Mitt Romney, <laughs> if anybody remembers that, uh, that line from Mitt Romney, corporations are people, my friend, no matter what he says, they're not. It's a, it's a mindless entity, actually resembling more of a sociopath than a, than a good human being. Exactly. But, um, but I do think that... Um, the people that work in the business are good. So that's, that's the kind of like the dichotomy of the two. Can you dispel the, the commonly held belief that uh, uh, it's a liberal media as opposed to sure. a commercial media? I, I, yeah, it's funny. It, it, there's an irony that I was, that I was talking to um, some of my friends about. I've got, we represent people that work at NBC and we represent the people that work at Fox. Now, Fox is, is not FBC, Fox Broadcast, Fro or it, it is, it's FBC, it's Fox Broadcasting Services. So mm -hmm. it's the network, and they have everything. It's a, they have the, you know, whatever's on Fox, you know, they're the, the network or the cable we were representing, or we are, we are representing. There are less run-ins with those guys from a union standpoint, they rarely ever like try and subjugate or subvert the contract or like just pull some shenanigans on our, on our, on our folks over there. That's a rarity from Fox. On the other hand, NBC, who is, you know, MSNBC, everybody thinks about, you know, liberal media and are terrible to work with. They're the most, by the way, MSNBC isn't unionized in case anybody was asked, uh, didn't know that. Huh. They won't let us, uh, they won't let NABIT uh, organize them. They, are you kidding? They're like the, they closed, they actually had a room where the MSNBC was in, in one of our old, uh, in one of the old shops and they locked the door. You had to have security to get in there. They wouldn't let us in there. Wow. So it just goes to show you that liberal media is a fallacy. I think that media in general tends to be a, a, a truth finder and it, wherever, wherever it does find that truth, be it you know, um, you know, if like I, right now, because Trump is doing so many bad things, he is literally saying, well, they're against me, so they must be liberal. But the very, if you really think about this, Trump is kind of a liberal in some ways. I, and, I, and I'm sure that his Republican like friends, that's why they're distancing some, themselves from him right now, because he's not their best friend. He does say some crazy things that are outrageous and he's not a good, 
I, I don't think he's a good president in any way, shape or form, but I don't think he's like what the Koch brothers envisioned. <laughs> with, <laughs> for their really not Ronald Reagan. He's there, no, they wish he was. They really do. They need Ronald Reagan right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about your mayoral race. As the fact that you're coming from the House of Labor going to be a, um, um, a, a point against you and, and you're a leaning left and you're uh, quite proud of that and you should be. But Thank how's you. that going to play in uh, Simi Valley? Well, hang on a minute. Well, actually I think it's the, it's on, it's the opposite. I think, um, I think I'll get brownie points, especially here. Believe it or not, uh, the city being as conservative as it is, is also a big labor town. Uh, most of our folks are in labor and in, in seeing our public sector uh, labor. So we've got a lot of police. It's a very, very big uh, police friendly town. Uh, and we have a lot of, um, you know, other folks that work in the public sector. We have Department of Defense. We have, uh, um, you know, obviously firefighters um, and folks of that nature. So they're unionized already. So having a guy come in with that kind of cred, I think might give me an actual boost for these, for that, you know, the undecided group. This election year though, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I got to say, it's going to be a weird, you know, it's going to be a weird race because of COVID. So I, I'm not going to be able to do it, some of the, and neither was my opponent, by the way. Although, you know what, he probably will. Because it's, you know what, that that type of person, he'll have like town halls with and pack the rooms of people. I won't do that because I won't put people's lives at risk because I'm running for office. But I will do um, what I have to, to get out there and, and, um, and meet people. I'm going to try and do a lot of these virtual town halls, and um, and I'm, but I'm going to have to at some point make you know go out there and people have to see me physically, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to put. I'm not going to have big big meetings where I'm going to be you know getting um, putting people's lives at risk. That's not something I'm I'm um, I'm in favor of. So that's going to have to be something to change. But I, like I said, the the union card for me, uh, if I'm you know if you want to call it that is um, actually, I think it'd be beneficial. Not a, it's not gonna be in this town of, of all places. But you know what, like I said, Los Angeles or California in general, the folks aren't anti-union by and large, you know? Like I think this is a labor friendly state and I don't mean it in the sense that the legislature is not just necessarily very labor friendly, but I think people in general are labor friendly. Folks that I speak to on the street, they find out you're in a union, they're like, oh man, how do I join? What do I gotta do here? I, mean, say, I wish we had one. I never, I rarely ever hear, it's hate happens. Don't get me wrong. There's some folks like, there's some folks in my local, by the way, and I'm sure this happens in many people's locals. They're like, well, what's the point of all these dues I'm paying? And you guys are spending money on politics. You know, you guys should stay out of all that stuff. I'm like, I don't think you know how it works, which again, takes me all the way back to the beginning of member education. Because if they don't understand the purpose of, uh, of how to build power and why unions need it, then they really aren't looking around at their members or lack thereof because we have had a huge hit. My local's taken a lot of damage in, in the last uh, 10, 15 years. And mm -hmm. now with COVID, it's gotten even worse. But you know, we've lost a lot of members and the locals throughout the country are losing members because of automation, because of bad legislation, because, and by the way, it doesn't have to come from one side or the other. It's It's been on both sides. And that's one of the reasons why I thought, you know, the more, the, this can't continue. Something major needs to change. And in my own small way, I mean, I'm not, I'm not running for president, and I don't, I don't, I don't ever conceive of myself ever doing that. But I certainly um, think this is a good start. And like I said, small, the, the down ballot tickets are the most important. The presidency, in a lot of ways, yes, it's a bully pulpit. You've got like a, that's an important office. So I'm not going to try and like diminish that. But the real work of legislation is really done at home. Uh, in Simi Valley, is, is the city council like Los Angeles that, that it's considered nonpartisan? It is. Um, we are, we're districted now. We didn't used to be. They were all at large city council. Mm. That, mean, that meant you could run, you could live in like the rich part of town, which is what they did. <laughs> all the folks that lived in the rich part of town ran for city council. And uh, they won all the time. And they, by the way, by and large still do. Most of our city council is not great huh. 
but we do have a really good champion of, of uh, for progressive justice on the city council. She's a she's a, an awesome woman, and I'm proud to call her my friend, um, Ruth Duevanos. And um, she's a teacher, but uh, she's also a, a union a, a union um, sister. And um, but she's a very very active person. And right. I, I'm you know like I said I'm proud to call her my friend. Her and her family are good. we're we're family friends, and. Um, I've known her for a while and I, and actually I knew her before she was on city council, but she's got her, you know, she's one against five right now. I got, we got Mike judge. Does anybody know who Mike judge is? Mike judge is the one that's like the, you know what to do with the, 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 the BLM guys, right? Get that pepper spray and some nooses and that'll take care of that. He posted this stuff oh, yeah. on Facebook, man. This is our city councilman. He's a 30 year veteran of LAPD, which is part of the problem. If you have LAPD veterans or any uh, uh, safety officer saying that kind of stuff, it does, it does him and his profession and the community a disservice. So does this mean you're not going to seek the uh, uh, police union's uh, endorsement? The POA, I mean, I might even get it. <laughs> Honestly, like I said before, in spite of him, um, himself i don't know if he's you know i don't know because right now a lot of these guys are doubling down which is a mistake yeah um a militarized police force is not the solution to today's problems we have we have other ways to solve it, these things there are so many things we could be doing that we're not talking about right now but we have but we have no way i have no interest in and there's a lot of good information if you guys seek to uh, want to seek it out on why uh, the police are militarized now, and you can actually it's because of the war. We had to. What did? What were they going to do with all that surplus stuff when Obama called the troops home? I mean, when I'm sorry, when uh, Trump called the troops home. Right. So they have all these like <coughs> things that should not be in police forces' hands. Uh, There's actually um, an article 1033 that uh, mandates that uh, a certain percentage of stuff that the Department of Defense has, has to go to fight the war on drugs. Well, that's where it started, because the war yeah. on drugs, and that actually started with um, with Reagan. But uh, when that funding, when he started funneling military funds or, or using military um, <clears throat> grade stuff for the police force, it changes the psychology of, I mean, I gotta say, it, it, it's not the same thing you look at a cop from 30 years, 40 years ago, he was, you know, dressed in blues. He had his you know, hat on. He was a, he was a public servant. That guy went out there and he served the public. Hey, what can I do for you, ma'am? I having a nice day. There's a, is there a problem? You know, that was, he was a peacekeeper. Today, I mean, it's like there are just way too many shootings. Way, you know, in some cases I'm provoked. In some cases they are almost, you know, I mean, to the point where you know, I guess you could say they're justified, but the reality of it is it could have been handled in a, it would have been handled in a different way 30 years ago. Now it's way too easy because it just is a different dynamic when you've got a fully automatic assault rifle as part of your arsenal, body armor that just came back from Iraq. But there's, you know, that's part of the problem. Also, I mean, the citizens shouldn't be armed the way it is either, but that's a whole different, that's a different, that's a whole different conversation. Exactly. You know, I don't think anybody needs assault rifles. I agree, but um, my dad's a Vietnam vet, and he's he's the most appalled of anybody that I know. He's like, he's like, what's this guy doing with a freaking M16? Does he know what that's for? He ain't gonna kill a deer with that. Well, I mean, we're from Texas, so that's the way he talks. Um, due to the 1033 program, um, LA Unified School District actually owns uh, uh, several uh, M16s. Um, I think it's four grenade launchers. <laughs> and uh, all sorts of things that I don't think Why? they know what to do with if they had to use them. It's insane. That's, a, that's, a, that's just, again, you know, and a lot of this was, you know, we had, I remember when the, remember when the uh, North Hollywood, um, oh, yes. the, bank robbery. The, the shootout happened when those guys came in with the loaded for bear and they, they took, they didn't kill, I don't think they killed any cops, but they injured a lot of them. Yeah. And that was kind of like, okay, see, what did I tell you? These guys are, 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 so we need this stuff now. And it was like the only excuse, it's funny, right? The minute that that happened, 
all of a sudden funding was going into making sure that there was never, this would never happen again. How many school shootings have we had in this country? Exactly. And we've never done a damn thing about. Exactly. So I'm going to pull you a little bit into the hot water here, if you don't mind. I don't know. Um, do you think police unions belong in um, the House of Labor? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, but I, but I will say that with a caveat. Police unions are unions as, as much as anybody else's. And I think in concept, they should be treated as such. But when you have a, a, an organization that literally is putting money hand over fist against the interest of labor, then they're not really your allies at that point, are they? Right. So we should know that. I mean, and I think that maybe the discussion for, you know, somebody like Trumka <laughs> at that level, I think more than for me, but it is a difficult, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a difficult question. And I don't know that it's a, a, an easy, an easy answer because it is, you know, like I said, conceptually, it is the same thing. Their unions are unions, they're public sector unions, but um, they literally are, you know, I, I don't know how they, well, I do know how they're functioning because they are POAs and because they are, they do have these associations. They're able to use the city. There's kind of, it's kind of a sim, like a symbiotic relationship they have, but not in a good way with most, with most city um, councils and most, and most mayoral uh, people. Cause they, they don't, I mean, they have a lot of power way in some ways, way too much. And they wheel that, you know, unfortunately, these guys are armed and, and um, most civilians, including myself, don't walk around, you know, just packing heat. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a difficult conversation or a difficult, it's a difficult question, Dan. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Oh, uh, Richard Trumka did weigh in on the subject. He said, we have irreconcilable differences with every employer we deal with, yet we deal with them. So I guess he's saying that we can work together. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me a whole lot. I, and I'm not, I, I'm, not saying that, that, I'm not saying that because I agree with him. I'm saying that because I would expect that to come from him. It's just a, yeah. uh, it's a you know, he's the world's most, he's the nation's top union leader. And, um, you know, like any executive at that level, he's trying to keep the ship afloat. Exactly. Uh, so do you think, um, it was once said by a, a leader of the, LA County Federation of Labor that uh, we act as an ATM for the Democratic Party. Uh, do you think we underestimate the sway that we have within the party, especially here in California? We labor in, in okay, I can speak for California because I don't, I really can't speak for the rest of the country. But in, in this state, labor, you know, does in some ways blindly support um, you know, like any blue will do, right? Okay. So we have it. We have districts. I mean, I have a, a a woman who I like. She's a nice person, not very progressive, and she certainly there's an idea that to run in this part of the, the country or in this part of the state, you have to be a centrist, because you know progressives, uh, you know, aren't wanted around. Uh, but I ask myself, who's saying that? And the thing is, it's a lot of these guys are party officials. So they say, well, no, we understand the, the area where you live in. They're not going to, they'll never vote for a progressive, but they'll vote for a centrist. What, if they're going to vote for a Democrat, they're going to vote for a Democrat, in my opinion. They're going to vote. Uh, if they're going to vote for a, a, a Republican, they're going to vote for a Republican. They're not going to vote for a centrist Democrat over a Republican if they're a Republican, you know? Not in those, not in those seats. Exactly. So I don't, I don't buy that. I think that you have to be... First of all, you should be true to yourself if you're running for office and not try and fit in with, um, you know, what just, I mean, don't take, don't, get, don't take this the wrong way. I think you need to be listening to others' opinions because it's not just, you know, sometimes you can get in your own head and think you're always right and that's not a good way to be. So I do listen to other people, but I always, I always follow my heart and I think I always have. And it's one of those things where you have to remember that when you're, when you're in office or when you're running for office, you don't, you shouldn't be trying to sell a fake version of yourself because at some point or another, that's not, that's going to be discovered because you're lying. You're not being honest. 
And if you are running and that, if that is your position, that's fine. And, and not everybody's, not everybody's going to be a progressive. Not everybody's going to be a, 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 a conservative. That's fine. But I think that you shouldn't discount the progressive um, voice by saying that this community or this part of the country or this part of the state uh, will never elect one. Because you know what? I've seen it happen before. And um, it's probably going to happen again, if I have anything to say about it anyway. Very good. What I'm just wondering, though, is what I've encountered at the state level of the Democratic Party is all these uh, labor officials have come in and they and they seem to defer to the party rather than uh, um, try to lead the party. Even though Alex Rooker, who comes from CWA, is vice chair, uh, one of the vice chairs of the state Democratic Party, yeah. she, um, when she had the chance, even when CWA uh, endorsed Bernie Sanders and her being a CWA member, she should have gone along with uh, that endorsement. She uh, chose to wear her party hat, <laughs> no yeah. pun intended, and and, uh, and endorse um, Hillary. I agree. I I, th I know, and uh, I, I think it was a huge mistake on her part. But you know, he won the state of California with or without her. That's true. A and um, that wasn't this. It wasn't the state that he that we had a problem with. It was the rest. Of the <laughs> it was Texas and the rest of the the, 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 mid the Midwest states. Exactly. And um, I really don't, I think that there was a lot of, of um, unfortunately, you know, when you run for office, you surround yourself with people that are, you're going to try and, and, uh, you know, better the cause. But sometimes, you know, you can miss the forest for the trees. And I think this happened uh, in this last, in this last primary. So they, he might have, I think his message is like the same as it's always been. And it's always going to be that way. And we, as a, as labor, should want more. When we negotiate contracts, we don't say, hey, I want 3%. Because if we say that, we know we're probably going to walk away with 1.5%. Exactly. So we ask for more because we know we have to, you know, at some point we're going to have to be, we're going, we're going to negotiate down a little bit. But you have to try and move the ball as far forward as you can. You can't just keep on saying things are good enough the way they are because, you know what, stasis is not a good thing for anybody. It leads to stagnant stagnancy and or stagnation and um and uh, and rot <laughs> so we don't, we don't want to have uh that you, you can't have that you have to there's the, the ball only moves forward or backwards staying right where you are look there is a, a a concerted effort being fought right now in this country to make sure we move that ball back as far as possible and if the person that's coming in you know, to play cleanup or bat, and he wins. This they say Biden wins this next election. And he's like, no, things are good right now. Everything is great. Then nothing from, and nothing that Trump did is going to get replaced or repaired. We're going to wind up living kind of in that same, you know, the post-apocalyptic Trump world under 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 the leadership of Biden. And you know, some stuff will change. He'll move some stuff. You know, he'll move a few things, but it's not going to be nearly enough, and it's not going to be enough for labor. And I will say this. To my, you know, to the to the to my uh, discredit of the party, unfortunately, but it's not that the Democrats have not been, and I get it right now. We don't have the power to do that, but I can, I can go back in time and tell you that, you know, even in the days of um, of uh, you know Bill Clinton, they weren't really friends of labor, because you have too many bad, too much bad legislation like NAFTA, or God forbid that uh, you know President Obama would have passed TPP. These are these are these are these are labor killers. It's bad enough the corporations are going after us to try and diminish us and, and kill us off. We don't need, you know, guys that are supposedly on our side helping them out. Exactly. So when I say when I vote, when I say you know, we, labor should put its money in the in in the and the money that we desperately you know we have hardworking people that make that money, and they trust us. Well, I should say my uh, the, my betters or the guys who were up at the very top. To, work, to know where to put that money and who to you know, give that money to. And uh, sometimes that just doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, it, does, it, it doesn't happen off, nearly often enough. So we have to find, nowadays things are changing, people are becoming, and I am very encouraged by the fact that uh, the younger generation are taking an active role in politics. You see a lot of progressives coming in with you know, running on the same ideals that, um, that uh, you know, our old friend Bernie was running on. 
and um, and I'm really I'm, it gives me hope for the future. So I'm I'm you know I'm on I'm on the same page as those guys, and I and I want them to succeed because I think that like I said before, you can't stay staying where you are, staying in the middle of the street is a good way to get run over. <laughs> That's a very good saying. I'm going to co copy that one for myself. <laughs> um, do you have anything else you'd like to say to sort of summarize? Uh, no, thank you, Dan. I just wanted to say thank you for uh, allowing me to be out here and, and, uh, and you know, talking everybody's ear off for the last uh, half hour or so. No, this, I, is, uh, this is just what we need to hear. Uh, this is stuff from the trenches. And, and uh, I think I appreciate it and I hope those who are watching appreciate uh, your uh, candor and your insight uh, because uh, we need more of that if we're ever going to right the ship of uh, state as far as uh, labor unions to get them to grow and thrive again. So thank, thank you, you very much, Joe. Thank you so much, Dan. I appreciate that. And um, like I said, um, I'm always happy to uh, talk people's ear off. I, I do that a lot and you know that better than most. Um, so anything else you need from me, please let me know. And if anybody has any questions, uh, you can feel them through Dan or, or um, you can reach me on my Facebook page, Joe Ayala, at Facebook. And you got a website at, for the mayoral thing? Uh, not yet, I'm, I'm getting that put together. Actually, we're putting together the whole thing just now because we've had some other, we had some uh, hiccups in the road getting into this campaign, but it's it's proceeding along, uh, it's, it's going forward now. So um, yeah, I'm filing uh, next week. Very good, I wish you the best of luck, my friend. Thank you, brother. I'll be calling you again to ask for help and money. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> you got it. All right, brother. Be good. Talk to you soon. Okay. Um, I will take any questions, any comments on the Building Union uh, Facebook page. And excuse me, even if I don't address them here due to con time restraints or because I don't know what that heck I'm doing as far as the technology goes. I will promise that um, we will be getting this information out to you. Any questions and, and answers that uh, come up. And I hope that um, you've uh, enjoyed this so far. Um, I've called in a lot of favors to get these uh, folks uh, to speak on these subjects. And um, I think that uh, more dialogue like this is going to contribute to the success, future success of labor. Um, let me talk about a couple of things in, uh, that are happening in the union I'm currently in. I'm with the National Writers Union. I've been their recording secretary for 15 years. And uh, in that job, I take minutes of all the official goings on and uh, I then uh, post those uh, to the website. Um, those uh, meeting minutes are sometimes hard to, to put together because dealing with a, a group of writers, everyone wants to uh, wordsmith everything that is uh, put in the minutes. Um, but uh, it's been an enjoyable experience and uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was the, the successes that our union is having. Uh, we were very large at one point. There were 7,000 members in the National Writers Union within the UAW. Um, and uh, we're now down to about 1,500, but uh, there's been some uh, really clever <coughs> organizing uh, um, methodologies, uh, methodologies that are being used to grow our membership. For instance, our president, Larry Goldbetter, is writing letters uh, for folks uh, to uh, acquire H-1B visas. These are jobs that have already been lined up by someone outside the country with, with a company here in this country. And those are jobs that wouldn't have gone to our members anyway. So he writes a letter uh, to the, the uh, State Department letting them know that uh, this is a good person, this is a, someone who will be paid correctly and has a, a contribution to make to American society. Another thing that uh, our union has been doing is we've created this outside organization that uh, deals with freelancers. 
the it's called the FSP and the freelancers um, um, come in uh, and uh, get under our umbrella so that they're protected as far as uh, negotiating uh, their contracts and and things like uh, that. And, uh, and we've grown by probably 300 members just through that organization. Another thing we do, we have a grievance in um, grievance in contract division, or not division, but committee that uh, will look at a writer's contract before they sign it to make sure they're not um, inadvertently giving away certain rights that they have. Um, another thing that we do is, um, let's see, what was the other thing? Um, we um, go after magazines, publishers who uh, have reneged on their contracts to pay writers for a particular article uh, in their magazine. And uh, what we'll do is we'll send them a letter saying, please uh, pay the writer. And if they um, don't do so, then uh, we uh, usually take them to court uh, to uh, make sure that uh, those writers uh, make the money they deserve. And that has brought a, a lot of great folks who have gone into the leadership of this union and uh, work, we continue to battle uh, publishers on that front. So those are some of the out of the box ideas that the National Writer U Writers Union has come up with for organizing and growing. And uh, I can only see um, better things happening because of that. Uh, some of the country, oh, another thing that we do is uh, we've uh, started out, uh, with the efforts of uh, our Vice President David Hill. We've gone to um, companies, uh, or not companies, but publishers, uh, such as In These Times uh, and several other magazines that are pro-union and said, um, let's, let's figure out some uh, freelance writers' rates. And so we've tried to help establish a, 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 a floor level and a, I'd say, let's, let's say floor level of um, benefits and, and pay for freelance writers that, that uh, uh, write for these magazines. And the list is growing. And uh, again, that's another out of the box thinking on behalf of our union to uh, help writers who um, are not getting paid or getting paid substandardly because a lot of writers depend on um, their income to live on. And if they're not making a decent living writing, it's not necessarily because, uh, because they're not doing enough writing, but the fact that uh, publishers are paying uh, the, the least that they can uh, uh, get by with to say that they paid the writer. And that uh, it brings me to a, another company uh, that I wrote for. I won't mention their name. Actually, I think I will, called Gaycation. And I had written an article for them. And um, I wrote a nice letter saying, by the way, it's been a month. You haven't paid me yet. And uh, they said, well, we do pay our writers. So hang in there. We're kind of busy. And so another month went by, and then another month, and then another month. And finally I said, listen, I tried to be nice about it, but if you're not going to pay me, then uh, I'm going to have to go to my union and file a grievance. And uh, right away I received the pay, and I also was blackballed by the magazine, who said because of my attitude, they didn't want to work with me ever again. So um, there's... Um, plus or minus to that story. But uh, that's what happened to me and uh, probably happens to a lot of writers. Be fair but firm in your dealings with others. Know which battles aren't that important and which ones are. And that's um, because sometimes uh, you, especially in negotiations, for instance, you're, you're bargaining for something and uh, you really want this particular issue, healthcare, you want them to to pay more for your health care. But you also have asked for an extra day off due to a holiday or something like that. So uh, you're going to not necessarily fight for both of them. Uh, it depends on which one your members feel is more important. Yeah, that's probably the health care costs. So 
um, that's the battle that you're going to wage. And the other one, you're going to um, lose because, you know, you're not going to get both of them. In some cases you can, but in a lot of cases you can't. Uh, that's a suggestion that I received. And uh, I just wanted to thank you for tuning in. And I'm going to record all this and uh, uh, let people be able to see it later. That's it for today. We talked with a candidate for office um, who explained why labor is so important to her. Uh, we found out more about what makes an arbitrator tick and what he feels we can do to, to uh, revive the labor movement. And we talked with a union official about dwindling jobs and resources in a COVID-19 world. And we um, discussed strategies for labor's future. Tomorrow we wrap this up with uh, what, uh, this webinar with a former candidate who compares the two major political parties with other options. And uh, also my friend Lou Siegel will talk to us about uh, the e efficacy of um, boycotts and strikes in today's uh, electronic world where jobs can be sent somewhere else at the flip of a switch. Thanks for spending your time with us and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.